I'm Zabine Herji, and I serve as chair of Civic Action. And it is such a great pleasure to welcome you to Canvas Civic Action Summit 2019. And just judging by the energy in the room, I know this is going to be a great day. As we all know, we are in a period of profound change, economic, social, political, technological, and demographic shifts are reshaping our lives. The GTA is now home to 7 million people. It's one of the most diverse city regions in the world, and more than 70,000 indigenous people live in our region. We power 20% of Canada's GDP. With this growth and scale comes tremendous opportunities, but at the same time, it brings some challenges. And developing solutions requires new ways of working together, collaboration and co-creation across all sectors, business, government, educators, and not-for-profit is essential to unlocking the full potential as a region and as a nation. Without question, harnessing the power of collective leadership will accelerate progress towards achieving our vision of who we want to be, a united, strong, vibrant, and inclusive region. A region that believes better is always possible, and that's exactly why we're here today. The summit is our Civic Olympics. It happens every four years. It signals a new leg of the race for civic action. And today's theme, Canvas, drawn together for a purpose, acknowledges our setting, the beautiful AGO. But it does much more. It's at the core of what we've set out to accomplish to bring together people from diverse walks of life, backgrounds, and experiences, to put our challenges on the table and generate solutions and paint a different picture for our region. Before we start our day, I ask you to picture the path you took to arrive here this morning. On your journey, many of you would have crossed the traditional territory of many indigenous people. This includes the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Onishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the Scugog, Island First Nation, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat. We are grateful to be gathered on this land today. I would like to acknowledge a few people here today. Uh, we are delighted to be joined today by Her Honor, Elizabeth Dowdeswold, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, a longtime friend of Civic Action. Thank you for being here. You always light up her, uh, the room, Your Honor. Many elected officials will join us throughout the day. The Honorable Patty Haidu, Federal Minister of Employment, Workforce Development and Labor will be at our parallel event, the Design Jam at Mars. The Honorable Rod Phillips, Ontario Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks will be here, as will the Honorable Lisa McLeod, Ontario Minister of Children, Community and Social Services, uh, and Mitzi Hunter, Member of Provincial Parliament. We will also have a number of mayors joining us, uh, Mayor of Brock, Debbie Bath Haddon, Mayor of Halton Hills, Rick Bonnet, Mayor of Mississauga, Bonnie Crombie, and Mayor of Toronto, John Tory. We are also joined by the Chief of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, Stacey Laforme. Thank you all for being here today. And a big thank you to our summit partners for making today possible because they share the civic action belief that city building requires partnerships. Our Catalyst partner, Deloitte, who helped design and deliver the Canvas Day. Our presenting partner, TD Bank, for supporting today's plenary session. Our summit champions, RBC and Scotiabank, and our summit leaders, Intact, Leona, Rogers, and Toronto Pearson International Airport. 
Civic Action has been driving action for over 15 years, from income security to transit to youth un unemployment, our collaborative model has helped move the needle on many issues. Since our last summit in 2015, we've been busy putting your good ideas to work. For example, we've connected thousands of youth to opportunities, developed a more diverse leadership pipeline, and built more mentally healthy workplaces. And you will hear much more about this later. Now it's time to look forward. Civic action sits at the nexus of where different sectors and leaders of today and tomorrow converge. We bring people together and show what's possible when we set the bar high and take action to reach it together. Today is about having important and perhaps at times uncomfortable conversations. It's about listening, learning, and reaching out across the aisle instead of either with me or against me mindsets. It's about harnessing the diverse voices of over 500 leaders. Today is about civic action. As I mentioned when I started, the energy in this, this room is really palpable and it brings to mind for me um, the words of uh, cultural anthropologist Margaret Mead who said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you for joining us. It is now my pleasure to invite Pat Green, Knowledge Keeper from Six Nations of the Grand River, to say a few words. I always have to have something in my hand, so I brought this up. <laughs> We're still here. Uh, it's, it's nice to, uh, to be invited here. I just wanted to share a couple of things with you. Years ago, some of our grandfathers sat, together, sat down together and were really tired of wars. There were five distinct nations. Cugas, Senecas, Onondagas, Mohawks, and Oneidas. Tired of war. So they start coming together and meeting together to declare peace on Turtle Island. And this is about, I'm saying 2,000 years ago because it took so much time to, uh, to, to, to come up with. Civic action, peace, putting our minds together. A great man once said in our community, let's put our minds together and see what we can come up with for our children. And I think in this day and age is the time that we need to do that. I'm not a typical opening up uh, conferences. I don't come up in a, and be a very spiritual person because I'm, a, I'm, I'm Haudenosaunee. I know who I am. I know my creator. And I talk to my creator every day. There's just so much I want to share with you about coming together and putting our minds together. I don't have what we usually call a smudge, but what I have is verbal smudge. And verbal smudge is doing just that. In our sacred circles, we come together, and before we enter the circle, we clear our minds. Because there's so much to share. We have so much to share. But sometimes we impose that on other people. So when we come into meetings like this with an open mind, we can also learn. We wash out our eyes so what's seen is meant to be seen. Sometimes we only see what we want to see. And then we wash out our ears so that the words that are spoken are the words that are meant to be heard. Sometimes we only hear what we want to hear. And in a traditional way, we take a drink of water. And what that drink of water does is to clear that pathway from our mind to our hearts. 
so that we think with our feelings and feel with our thinking. And I think that's really necessary in this day and age because there's so much out there that uh, disrupts our emotions, so much that disrupts our thinking. And it's about coming back into balance. One of our greatest leaders once said, do not lead, I may not follow. Do not follow, I may not lead, but walk with me and be my friend. That just makes so much sense in this day and age. So with, uh, with that, I'm going to leave you with those thoughts. Those are yours now. If we didn't know those before, we know them now, and you are responsible for yourself. You are responsible for the way you think, for the way you feel, and the behaviors after that. And I was checking up the, some of the uh, lighting on the walls, and they were talking about youth and talking about uh, addictions and all those things that, uh, that have disrupted our, that is disrupting our communities. And I've worked in the field of treatment for a long time. And it's not so much the addictions and the, the dis-ease of the day, it's what leads up to that. Our past and our responses to the, our past, to the impositions of our past that still affect us today. So I hope that we can all put our minds together and put the past in the past where it needs to be, but also recognize to learn from the past. I think we have an awful lot of histories in here that if we put them together, we're going to learn an awful lot about running this world and being part of a community. One of the biggest things that I have to work with on a day-to-day -day basis in working with people who are addicted and suicidal is the sense of where do I belong? Who do I belong with? And when we work with these people, we have them come to themselves. Balance out the things that I just talked about, the way we think, the way we feel. Balance out that we are no longer have to carry the pains of our ancestors, but be here today. I think that's very important, especially when we're dealing with uh, uh, addictions and, and people with those kinds of diseases and those kinds of diseases in our communities. To find out where we belong within ourselves, where we belong in our families, where we belong in our communities, and where we belong in the rest of the world. And I think that we can all relate to that. So I want to thank you very much for asking me to come here. And just a reminder that, yes, we are still here. The Haudenosaunee people are here. We have lost nothing, but we share everything. So thank you very much. Well, good morning. I have the great privilege of being the CEO of Civic Action. <laughs> so my name is Sevon Palvetsian. This is my second summit. And I know for many of you in this audience, you've been here for the last 15 years, every four years, when we hit Control, Alt, Delete, and do this all again. What you're going to experience today at Canvas intends to shake you up a little bit. We crowdsource our operational plan. Every four years, we bring together a diverse group of folks from all sectors, from all parts of this region, all walks of life. And we put to you what we believe are those big, meaty urban issues that require an all-hands-on-deck approach. We put them to you but we don't load the how. How we tackle these issues comes out of each of you. And so this is a very important day for us because we, in effect, crowdsource our operational plan. I thank you in advance for spending a full day, which we know is not easy to do with very busy lives and multiple layers of need that sit on you. 
But on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you in advance for bringing your big thinking, bringing your ideas, and bringing your passion for this region to our day. The group that sits in the first couple of rows sit with us every day as our board of directors. I like to say we have the best board in the biz, and it's absolutely the case, because these leaders not only bring their A game to our world as directors with our organization, but they also are folks that we can talk to, work with, and lean on in between those meetings, making sure that action happens. So thank you to each of our board members for making this a priority, for making your work part of ours, and for making sure that your organizations lean into the city building efforts as well. I would like you all, if you could please, to join me in a round of applause for these people. So this is team action. These are the people that I get to consider colleagues and friends, and frankly, it's pretty much family. And there are six faces from this wall of faces behind me that in particular made today happen. Sarah, Leslie, Yelena, Jeff, Aaliyah, Cynthia, you have birthed quite a baby in today, and I want to thank you for all the pain and the labor of love that it's been, but I know that our delegates here today are really going to enjoy the impact of what that curated experience has made, been, been made possible by you. So we're 15 years old as an organization, and I mentioned, and Zabine had indicated at the beginning, that every four years we have this summit to be able to hit control alt delete and focus on those big messy challenges that need collective action now this slide which is also in your programs in that fancy pants app that you may have downloaded you can see at a high level all the impact that we've had over those 15 years this is but a snapshot but it's important to point this out to you because you're going to spend a day with us and we want you to understand that this is not just about putting 3m sticky notes on a board this is not just about dreaming up the art of the possible. We're civic action, not civic chit-chat. So what you tell us to do, we get on and do. And this is an example of some of what we've done in those last 15 years. Since our last summit, which through the amazing support of some of our partners, including Phil Hayde from Public, Phil, give a wave. Phil has helped to make the visual branding of this day possible. And our last round at City Summit in 2015, we brought many of you together. And we had an extraordinary day. And some of the issues that we talked about have spurred the kind of action that we have listed on this slide behind me. We've powered almost 1,000 organizations to do something about mental health. Pat talked about that in his opening remarks. Mental health is a major issue that's affecting every family, every workplace. Everybody is no more than one degree of separation from this. And through your ideas that started in 2015, we launched Minds Matter. That has the benefit already to benefit about 2 million employees in this region. You came up with that idea. We helped to make it possible, but through great supports, and I thank you for being part of it. We've also focused on making the labor market more transparent for young people, in particular, young people who face multiple barriers. Our award-winning Youth Connect, done in partnership with some of you here in the City of Toronto and others as well, has trained 700 and front, 750 frontline community workers who work directly with youth. You are on the front lines, and who gives you professional service development? Well, through Youth Connect and a crop of amazing partners, that's what we've done. And we're very proud of that program and one of the results since 2015. Two thousand seventeen also marked an important era for civic action when we launched the Leadership Foundation under the leadership of Jody Ron. The award winning Diversity Fellows Program, now in its tenth cohort, has now two hundred and fifty fellows. Some of you are in the room with us this morning, and we have an amazing alumni base of people that are doing great things for their communities here and frankly all over the world. And our emerging leaders network is now two thousand members deep. Four years ago at our last summit, it was 1,000 members deep. So anybody that says that this generation is apathetic is dead wrong. They're just looking for new ways to play. And this model of active engagement and community building with real teeth is where they're looking to find it. And thank you for putting that as a priority in our work as well. 
So really, my job here today, in addition to laying out what we've done, is to recognize some of the partners that we've worked with, including TIFF, the National Film Board, and the U of T Urban Policy students that have helped to make our fact sheets possible. But it's really to lay out for you the five topics that are going to inform our work plan over the next four years. We start with the future of work. You can't get through a news cycle or even a government speech that doesn't touch upon the changing nature of work. I drop my girls off at school in the morning and I see those little ones toddling in with the big backpacks on their shoulders. They are entering school today and they're going to enter the workforce doing jobs, the majority of them, that don't even exist yet. You don't need to be an elementary school kid to see that change happening. In Canada, over the next decade, 25% of jobs that we all have are going to be fundamentally affected by automation. We used to make leaps of progress as a species over centuries. Our history books, books prove that. But through technology, those leaps of progress now happen in months or moments. That diploma on the wall, those letters behind your name, that's not going to be an insurance policy for what's coming. Education will always be the great equalizer, but it's going to require pivots. And the gig economy is going to require new protective planning. Opportunities are absolutely dangling, but the threads will not tie themselves together on their own. So how do we prepare our workforce for what's coming? One of the topics we'll be discussing today. 75 years ago, a guy named Maslow laid out a hierarchy of needs. At the very basic, at the very bottom of that triangle, among other needs, was a need for shelter. Well, the need for this over those 75 years really hasn't shifted, but the opportunity to get that need met here in this region, well, that sure as heck has. The availability and the affordability of housing is beyond reach for many, and increasingly so in the GTHA. And housing isn't just a budget line, it is our lifeline. It's where our sense of security sits. It's where our sense of community grows. It's where we raise our families. It's what we consider home. But here in the GTHA, it is simply out of reach for far too many people. Home prices continue to rise, vacancy rates are at an all-time low, and so it begs the question, where are we all supposed to live? The conversation also lends itself at times to our backyards, as in, not in mine. 88% of people say, yeah, we need to build more housing. But half of those people say, just don't put a mid-rise half a kilometer from my house. We need to start talking differently about housing, and let's start that process today. This next topic, you may be surprised to see on our list. It sure shocked me to understand the size of this problem and the prevalence of this issue right here. Sex trafficking is one of the fastest growing criminal activities around the world, and it's here, gang. It's here in the GTHA. There isn't a hotel that's immune to it, and even in your condo building, through Airbnb, it may be taking place right across the hall from you. This is an issue that is postal code agnostic, and what if I told you that the key to many of the procurement strategies behind this sat in your pocket? Social media accounts have made it far too easy to troll for victims, and girls as young as 11 as 13 are pulled in, often by people that they think care about them, or at least alleged to from the outset. Once in, it can take five to seven different interventions to try to get that girl out. In that time period, it cauterizes her youth, it suffocates her dignity, it degrades her mind and her body. Police services in great groups like Covenant House and others are doing so much to try to stop this but there's no silver bullet. There may, however, be a bronze one, and that's prevention in the first place. So this is one of the topics we want to work with you on, to make sure that awareness and prevention happens so that all of our young people are safe in this region. Last century, our relationship to the planet changed. It used to be that the effects we had on our local environment stayed that way, stayed local, but that's gone. Our world is now very much part of the big macro concept, and that can be really hard to comprehend, to understand. 
But we absolutely must, because we are baking and drowning this planet with relentless momentum. It's not just raining anymore, it's submerging us. Floods that used to happen every 40 years now happen every six. We have our military on guard fighting the war on water down the road in the province beside us. This is our new reality, folks. And it's not just water. The hot days that you remember as a kid, well, they're increasing four times over the next decade. We need to be prepared, as extreme weather does not care one bit about the boundaries that it flows over or the mercury levels records that it sets. And it's going to cost us, because every time we flood, it has a macro backdrop, yes, but it also has a local cost as well. How many here in the room have a basement? If that basement floods, that's going to cost you $40,000 on average. And if you don't tend to that in the first 48 hours, then mold sets in, and then those costs starts to rise. They start to rise. Most Canadians have about $2,000 they could scratch together to start to tackle that kind of disaster. So you can see how these costs add up, and you can see why we do not have an, an option. We do not have the privilege of inaction on this topic, both in understanding how we can mitigate climate change and the realities that are coming our way, but also prepare for them as they come with, fight, uh, with flight and pretty big intensity. Gang, it's 2019. So a discussion about diversity and inclusion needs to be about a whole lot more than closing a confidence gap or lengthening a talent pipeline. Now, I know that many of you in this room are doing a lot to not only push the envelope, but to shake it up and tear it into little pieces and start again. But we need to all collectively acknowledge that in some corners of senior leadership, culture has calcified. We live in the most diverse region on the planet, and yet we leave so much of our talent on the bench. Visible minority representation on corporate boards sits at about 4%. That's a rounding error. That is not a representative stat. And women in leadership positions, well, they are 60% less likely to move from director to vice president. People have been saying for years, you know what we need is more business cases. We need business cases to prove that groupthink is a liability. We have those. Shelves are heaving under those. So it's time to acknowledge that this really hasn't changed too much. And it's time to agree that we make that change happen. What is it really gonna to take to make sure that our leadership levels across our sectors look like the people that live in our region? So these, I agree, are not small or easy issues, but you wouldn't expect that of us, and that's not why we've assembled you to tackle them. These are big issues that we know are going to require the wisdom of crowds, and we're thrilled that we do this and help to push the envelope also on knowledge through partners like the Toronto Star, Toronto Life, and Edelman, and many others. We're going to take your ideas that come out of today, and they're going to form our operational plan for the next four years. So thank you in advance from Team Action and our boards of directors for making sure that your smart, crunchy ideas find their way into our workplaces and action to come. It's now my pleasure to introduce a leader who is also a status quo. I think you're allergic to it, Tim. He straddles the 49th parallel and does great work on both sides, Canada and the US. He is president and CEO of TD Ameritrade. He's also chair of our Civic Action Leadership Foundation. Please join me in welcoming to the stage our friend, wonderful human being, Mr. Tim Hockey. So I'm sitting beside uh, Zabine, and we're sharing notes. Um, and I've said this before at these events. Um, first of all, as, as co-chairs of this great civic action um, organization, Zabine and I share the honor of, of uh, working with this small but mighty team. But most importantly, the most important thing from any chair's point of view is having a great CEO. And so <clears throat> we sit here and we watch uh, Sevan talk about what she does, but we watch her every day with the team to deliver what she does. But I have to tell you, the thing that is most exhilarating is to watch her when she comes up on stage and deliver with passion what, uh, what it is we're going to talk about for the rest of the day. But I will say to the team that always puts me 
after Sevon in a speaking engagement. If you do it again, I'm quitting as chair. <laughs> it is just not fun to follow her. She's so good uh, up on stage. Um, so uh, thank you all for, for being here. This is a really special day. I mean, once every four years, we couldn't be more thrilled. This is, uh, this is a real coming together of the talent that makes this city rock. Um, as Sev told you, I, uh, I live on both sides of the uh, of the 49th, um, and it gives me a unique perspective. My, my family is here, my, my heart is here, but I live in New York City and I travel around, so I get to see a lot of what the issues that uh, we've been talking about from, from, a couple of, uh, from, from a couple of lenses, I'd say. You know, for many around the world, the greater Toronto region is seen as a jewel. It's seen as a great city, but I would say it's not seen as a truly world-class city. And part of what we are going to do today is to continue our journey along uh, to get us there. We've got a booming economy. We have an enviable tech sector. We have a diverse population and some of the finest academic and cultural institutions you will find anywhere on the planet. But if we're honest with ourselves, the GTHA isn't without its challenges. And we have some real work to do if we want to move from good to great. Now, just moments ago, Sev talked to you about the five big urban challenges on our agenda today. And I can tell you, as the, as the boards worked through, there were a lot more. We just had to five the big, find the big five that we felt were a manageable number to, to deal with today. And I'm looking forward to actually diving in with all of you and hearing about your collective ideas. Crunchy ideas, is that what I heard? Crunchy ideas. Okay, I'm using that one. Uh, on how we're going to move, move the needle do forward while ensuring that people aren't left out or behind. So the reality is that we do live in very challenging times. As we know, inequality is growing. I never thought I'd say that. Trust in institutions and, trad media and traditional media is shifting. And racism, hate, and injustice remain prevalent in so many corners of society. As I said, I see this play out uh, every day from my vantage point in the US. And despite our universal health care up here, I think you'd all agree that we aren't immune to that uh, in Canada either. My hope is that by coming together at Canvas from whatever community or sector or lived experience that you identify with, we will all find ways to build bridges, break out of those echo chambers that we often find ourselves in and collectively move forward. The good news is that we've already started with over 500 people coming together today in this unique space. But the actual impact of this day goes well beyond the walls uh, and the halls of the AGO. Parallel to today's summit, we're partnering with IBM to host an action-packed design jam at Mars with over 100 participants. We also have a group joining this conversation via live streaming. And in the lead up to today's events, over 500 people from across the GTHA participated in Civic Dish. It's an innovative, or was an innovative public engagement campaign that collected some really great ideas, including a NIMBYism campaign designed to look beyond single family home ownership, using gamification to test for job skills beyond their traditional resume, and better linking organization outcomes to attracting and retaining diverse talent, to name a few. Thank you to everyone who attended a Civic Dish or hosted a Civic Dish, and a special thank you to the individuals and organizations who made these conversations possible, including the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce, the Hamilton Community Foundation, Brain Rider, MP Selena Caesar Chavan and her team, the City of Toronto, Uber Eats, and our media partners, CBC Toronto, Toronto Life, and Toronto Star. Thank you very much for your sponsorship. So what now? Well, to those of you in the room and on the live stream, thank you for being here and for investing your time and energy into making our communities the best that they can be. I'd also like to acknowledge the many rising leaders here today who have engaged with us through our diversity uh, diversity Fellows and Emerging Leaders Network. Can I get them to stand or raise your hand if you're a member of either of those organizations? As Sev calls you all civic rock stars. <laughs> So as a business person, I believe in smart investments, and there is no smarter investment than investing 
in your region's talent pipeline. You are such an important part of what we are here to do today and a part of the solution. And I actually think back to what Pat Green, our knowledge keeper, said just a few minutes ago, which is come together and think of things we can leave for our children. I hope you never lose the fire in your belly uh, and that you can uh, continue to get together and talk about how we can make things better in our community. So to the collective group, my challenge to you is to not stop showing up. Together, we are creating a force multiplier effect that we will feel for generations to come. So let's get started. So to kick things off, we have tapped someone who doesn't really need any introduction, but he is the best interviewer in town and a great friend of civic action. Please join me in welcoming the host of CBC's Metro Morning, Matt Galloway, to the stage to introduce our panel. Morning, everybody. You all seem pretty laid back and quiet for a group with this kind of brain power. Good morning, everybody. Um, what a great thrill to be here uh, for a couple of reasons. One is this is an amazing place, and we are fortunate to live in this region. But as uh, Sivan has said, and as Tim has said, this is also a region that does face some big issues and some real problems. And one of the concerns, we talk about this on a daily basis on our program, is that if we don't get this right, um, we'll lose that brain power that wants to make this an even better place. And so that's why something like this isn't just important, but it's urgent. The other thing that's really exciting is just the opportunity to be in a room full of people who will take us in directions that we don't actually know about just yet. Um, I've been reading uh, a memoir written by the daughter of David Carr, who was one of the great journalists of our time, wrote for the New York Times, um, thought about media and culture and technology and society. And one of the things he told young journalists all the time is, we lead really boring lives, so go out and meet more interesting people than you are, steal their ideas, tap their ideas, come back and make what you're doing a better thing. We have a board in our, uh, in our uh, office where we meet every single day and we talk about what's going to come up on the program the next day. And the deal is, tell me something I don't know. That's what I ask of our team and that's what I love, is to be told something I don't know, to learn something that maybe I'm not aware of yet, that's around the corner that I haven't thought of. And that will make me a better person, but hopefully the work that I do will make the city uh, think differently about the place that they're in. And that's hopefully what we're going to do this morning. We have some great guests here who are going to talk about those big five issues and hopefully tell us something that we don't know about them, but also how to tackle them and get us beyond what we're calling the status no. Welcome, if you would, our esteemed guests for this morning. We'll bring them all up uh, all at once. Dr. Wendell Nilaria Ajete is the W.L. Mackenzie King Fellow and Lecturer on History at Harvard University. Abigail Mariah is a Senior Development Manager, New Commons Development, which is a non-profit housing developer. Rod Phillips, Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks, and the MPP for Ajax. <laughs> Michelle Powell, Detective Constable with the Toronto Police Service in the Sex Crimes Unit. <laughs> and Mandy Renahan, the founder and CEO of Freshco. They call her the Blue Collar CEO. Um, all right. Lots of smarts here. I did. I was trying to think of how we could start this conversation. And um, without speechifying, um, I thought it would be interesting to have each of you in, I was going to say one sentence, but I'll give you two because we're generous. Talk about, for each of the issues that you're experts on and that you're going to be focusing on, what's at stake in this region if we don't get it right. And I want to start with you, Wendell, and the idea of inclusive cities. What's at stake if we don't get it right? Do you have a microphone? I had one. You had a microphone? The battery might have died. Oh, there we are. There we go. 
Thank you, Matt. That's and perfect. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to quickly thank Seb and her team for this great work and for inviting me. I'd like to thank my co-panelists as well, and of course you, Matt, for being here this morning. What's at stake in terms of inclusive leadership? Yeah, and inclusive cities. In and inclusive cities. It's so important for us to understand the context in which we live and how we arrived at this moment. And so in understanding what's at stake, we have to pay close attention to the fact that this nation and the United States as well came about specifically to ensure that some have and others don't. It was forged purely on the principle of enshrining rights and privileges and entitlements to a small few. And so in this context, now that we are vigorously working towards um, removing some of the barriers inherent within an unjust, unequal society, we must take into account this idea of uh, threat perception or the, the fear factor that's within um, progressive ideas of progressive words such as inclusion. When people often hear that word, their backs straighten up and they think that they have something to lose. And so I'll leave it there and expand more later. A few more than two sentences, but I'm a generous man. <laughs> um, Abigail, for you, what's, what's at stake if we're talking about the idea of affordability and housing affordability and, and as I say, to people being able uh, to afford to stay in the city or the region that they want to be in? I think simply, um, where will we live? And um, home and housing is a foundation to our stability, our ability to function, our quality of life. So the question is, where will we live? And, um, and who will actually be part of the city of Toronto and who will not be there? It's pretty simple. Rod Phillips, for you. Um, if we're talking specifically about the issue of adaptation, preparing for extreme weather, we're seeing it all around Bracebridge, two hours north of the city of Toronto, uh, underwater in many areas. What's at stake in terms of talking about this in a meaningful way? I think uh, if it's where will we live, it's how will we live. Uh, when we talk about climate change, we have had a focus on the mitigation element, the part about reducing, and that's an important um, part of the discussion, how do we reduce our greenhouse gas footprint, but up until relatively recently it was very difficult to have the conversation about adaptation, which is the focus today, how are we going to live, um, because, uh, because that was an acknowledgement of failure on the first instance. And, and I think we've moved past that now because the reality is there, it's in front of us, you mentioned a couple of instances. So this is going to be about what affects and, 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 and how does it affect us individually. Savon, uh, quite rightly pointed to things like flooded basements. Uh, but there are lots of those individual uh, elements that we need to bring forward and understand because that's going to motivate the kind of change in, in how we live that we all have to adapt to if we're going to tackle that issue. Michelle, we'll get to you. Um, if we're talking about this, in many ways, hidden issue of, of human trafficking in this city, um, what's at stake in terms of, of dealing with it in a way that, that has real urgency behind it? What's at stake, basically, I'll keep it really simple, are young people. Losing our young people to this crime of human trafficking. Okay. That will give us a lot to talk about. Um, Mandy, for you, um, the whole idea of the future of work and the terror that surrounds it can be paralyzing to a lot of people, and we can talk about um, acting or not acting in the face of the big challenges, but when you see those challenges in front of us, what's at stake in terms of wrapping our heads around it? Well, first of all, I'm a hot air balloon because I'm from the East Coast, so two sentences isn't going to hit it. <laughs> <laughs> and you only had one, so I'm stealing half of your sentence. So you can take the East Coast <laughs> right. version of, a t of two sentences. <laughs> you know, I, I think that happy Monday, everybody. And, you know, the thing that I'd like to say is, is that they call me the blue collar CEO because I'm redefining the collar blue and changing the answer to what do you want to be when you grow up. And right now we have a systemic skilled trade shortage that nobody knows how to articulate to you. And everything that was put up on that board between our kids not having a place to work, our houses flooding, us wanting renovations done to our homes, people not having places to live, all fall back on the exact same thing. 
we do not have the people to help us through this because we live in a country right now that had a class system brought back with it and the industrial revolution that's called if you're going to work in blue collar you're going to be second class and you need to go to university because that's how you're going to become a professional and that has really really that myopic thinking my friend has really hurt us on a level that I can't explain to you. And it's down in the US too, Mr. Harvard. I'm Canadian. Just want to let you know that, you and your amazing little cap. <laughs> but I will say that I have offices here in Canada and in the US, and I will say to you, I am a Canadian through and through. Holy shit am I ever. But I will tell you this, this issue is so, so relevant for us to talk about today, and I am always the penguin in between five giraffes. And everybody loves a penguin. So let's hit it, my friend. This is going to be fun. I wasn't expecting the penguin thing, but yeah, all right. <laughs> we'll go there. Um, there's a lot to unpack, so where do we start? I want to start with what you said about people getting their back up, Wendell, um, and the idea that if you raise these issues, um, these aren't new, none of what we're talking about here are new issues. Maybe they're new to you, but they're not new issues. Um, and one of the things that we've been charged with here on the panel is to figure out why it is that we aren't cracking those issues, what it is that we're talking about that perhaps we shouldn't be talking about, or what we aren't talking about at all. Um, Give me a sense about that, that zero-sum game, the getting your backup piece, and why is it that if you're talking about the issue of um, inclusivity, there are some people who still, in 2019, will say, but that means I'm losing something rather than gaining something. It took many decades um, from the turn of the 20th century up until now before most leaders in Canadian society, most business people, civic leaders, etc really appreciated that we did have a problem in our society in terms of prejudice and discrimination and all these other things. And when we invoke that word of inclusion, when we invoke diversity, when we invoke equity, et cetera, people invariably then think, well, you're implying that I am not a progressive person, that I am by virtue of not already engaged in work of inclusion, that I am contrary to the, the progressive ideals of society. And so I often tell leaders with whom I meet that we need to be mindful in terms of how we talk about diversity and inclusion. We need to engage the concepts not in this zero-sum, well, minorities might gain something so that others might lose, but that resources are more or less finite. And there are many opportunities for people to serve in really great capacities. And no one inherently has to lose, or no one group has to lose for another to gain. Is that fair, though? I mean, if we're talking about power, someone if you, who's in the corner office, if you want to put different people in the corner office, either you're going to build more corner offices and more desks and tables, or someone's going to have to leave. So isn't, isn't it a, a bit of someone's got to go for someone else to get in? Possibly, but if we approach inclusion in terms of you're not my direct enemy. I am not here to combat you. I am not here to imply that somehow you're prejudiced or um, you didn't have the necessary merits to obtain the job that you have or the position that you have. It changes the dynamic. It's actually very disarming when we approach leaders and we approach those who do have power in terms of creating a space where everybody can triumph. Have you seen that work somewhere? Absolutely. Give me an example. I am currently part of an organization that promotes peace and nation building in the heart of Africa, in Burundi. Burundi is the poorest country in the world that you've probably never heard of. It has less foot traffic in terms of tourists than North Korea, a country plagued by pogroms and ethnic cleansing and genocide, just wretched history. A few years ago, some of my partners and I launched a peace building and nation building foundation. There is, in most sub-Saharan African countries, an entrenched ethnic hierarchy of children who come from particular families who are destined to rule and those who will, are destined to become peasants. 
And so because my, uh, one of my co-founders comes from this region, because I was also born in Sub-Saharan Africa, understanding the dynamics, it was the same calculus that we put in place in terms of not alienating the ruling establishment, but giving them a stake in this new entity that we were creating, a new, um, more equitable, inclusive organization. It would seem, Abigail, that a lot of those lessons, the idea of the zero-sum game, could apply to housing as well. There's this whole idea, and Savan mentioned it, the issue of, of nimbyism, where people believe that to build more, you're going to take away from what I've already got. I've got mine, and I, d I don't want mine to be compromised at all by somebody else. It's, you know, you kick the rungs out of the ladder once you're already up. How do you see that playing out in your world? Yeah, I think that's, that's true. And I think that's been a big challenge for um, designing housing, building housing, particularly housing that's affordable. It, once you say affordable housing, or even housing that is affordable, individuals assume that it, there's stigmas that come with that. And the automatic around NIMBYism, it tends to really connect around um, property values and thinking of the neighborhood declining. And, um, and I think it's trying to reframe uh, what type of housing that we could be living in in cities. Um, I think in the past it's been you purchase a, ho a home. The goal of the Canadian dream of moving from an apartment to a single detached home has has been something that's been ingrained in us. It's something we, you, you um, graduate from university, you move through your first job, you might get an apartment and then you, you're destined to somehow saving up and buying that home. Well, is, is that the dream that we should be aiming towards? Are there other options? Um, we, people are buying more condos now. Could people be living in other types of homes such as duplexes or single or, or um, semis, row houses? Those are other options too. And there's neighborhoods where we see that happening in Toronto and elsewhere. And, and those neighborhoods are great neighborhoods. And they're neighborhoods where people would point to to say that I want to live there too. So I think part of it is reframing around what, what is our objective in terms of homes? What does that look like? And, and it looks very different for different people. And if we were able to think about communities that could have a range of, could, could have a range of housing types for people at different stages of life, with different abilities, uh, different income levels, um, different family structures or family status, being single or having a family, I think that really rounds out the idea around what I'm losing, what I'm gaining, and the community that I'm part of. Why are we having that conversation then? If, if the way that you laid it out seems very straightforward mm -hmm. and is going to enhance and build the neighborhood, we don't want to lose another generation of people. Is mm -hmm. it because, oh, oh, I'll leave it to you, why don't you think we're having that conversation now? I, I mean, I think what you said initially is part of it. It's people feel that there is something to lose, and it is an uncomfortable conversation. And we, as Canadians, tend to be very polite, and we don't want to necessarily have a conversation that is uncomfortable or that, that is maybe confrontational. And the conversation of housing and who gets what is confrontational, and it also is tied to money. Uh, to build affordable housing or to build housing that could be non-market could require, does require money. And it's something that we haven't done for a long time. And it is, it is a, the money side makes it contentious, I believe. I think the other reason why we're not having those conversations is perhaps we weren't aware of all of the issues. So it, it is automatically painted as an us and them. And perhaps the us now is actually, or the them now is actually us. It's, it's my child, it's my sister, it's my friend. And now I'm having a different understanding around what it means to actually stay in a neighborhood or to move to another place because I can't afford a place. Well, I was going to say, I mean, is your sense, just finally on this, that, that those who are making those decisions understand what's going on? I would assume the majority of people who are, you know, in levels of government own their own homes already. They're not, they might be thinking mm -hmm. about the affordability crisis for somebody else, but not for them, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're already in. Um, is your sense that that affects how this conversation is shaped? I do. I think so. I think so. I think those who are most impacted aren't often part of the conversations. They're not often part of the decision making. And that is part of the reason why we're not seeing uh, policies and we're not seeing plans. We're not seeing the money coming along to support those things because those people aren't part of the conversations. And I think if more of us who were impacted were actually part of the conversation, there was room created for that to happen, it does go back to inclusion, then that would shift the conversation, I believe, because we, we're not, even what we're doing today, I think is significant in shifting it, because we're not, we have people from all kinds of sectors here, different fields, and 
as Mandy said, it's all connected. And I do feel that having the conversation and just starting there is an important part, but often there's, it's, it's limited to a few assuming that what has to be done is known and often we don't have, we're not working with the data, we're not hearing the stories, and we're not talking with those who are most impacted. Rod Phillips, what's the box, and some of this picks up on, on just what Abigail was saying, what's the box that you think we're stuck in when it comes to dealing with a climate that is changing and the effects that we're seeing very directly of that? So the, the current box, and, uh, and blame the politicians for this, that we're stuck in is a debate about tactics and a debate about a particular uh, tool uh, around around carbon pricing that is uh, that is focusing the issue and focusing the conversation, which isn't a bad thing, um, but that is is freezing um, the public policy and the action that's required. That will uh, that will pass. And uh, and what I've been saying to to folks that are very interested in this issue, which are many, is that come November or so, um, we will have had that discussion about uh, about pricing, a carbon pricing, carbon tax. Uh, we'll also have had the completion of a number of court cases on it, and we'll still be at a place where um, what we have, which is, I think, very positive, is an alignment in terms of uh, the fact that this is one of the most important issues that we have to deal with. And so I've been encouraging, of course, many of us, including myself, will be involved in that that discussion right now, that box around uh, that particular tactic. But what I've been encouraging people who are very active on the issue to think about is where we pick it up on the other side. And I do that because in one of the jurisdictions that has had the greatest success, the, the United Kingdom, um, they got to this, you know, they got to it 10 years ago, they got to this through a very uh, similar discussion and debate about tactics, but on, on the back end of that, in 2008, they passed the UK Carbon Act, which, which started them down a path of addressing some of these issues uh, more clearly. So, so I, think, I, think, um, I think right now uh, we're, we're collectively tied up in a conversation about tactics, but I think, I think what we have is alignment around the, the issue and the problem, and then we can have serious discussions about severity uh, and, and how we're going to fix it once we get through the politics. What responsibility do you take for that? I mean, and if there is urgency, and if people, as the politician who's on stage, but the, per the person who represents that file as well, what, I mean, if that's the tactic and that's the thing that we're tied up in right now, what responsibility do you take for that? Um, you know, I think there's, there's uh, you know, two broad categories to blame. It'll be our, me and you. Uh, I think, I think um, you know, I, we, we presented a, a comprehensive approach to tackling the environment and to climate in November. We talked about uh, eight very pragmatic approaches that will get Ontario to the targets that the Prime Minister agreed to of a 30% reduction on 2005, uh, 2005 emissions um, and that the world agreed to in 2015. Um, and we've also talked about being open if there wants to be a national discussion about whether those to to topics are uh, or those targets are good enough. But, um, but the dialogue uh, around that, the public dialogue around that, the online dialogue, so I guess we can all take some accountability for that because we're all we're all Matt Galloway when we're on our Twitter account, um, is, uh, has, been, has been focused on this particular tactic of carbon pricing. So, so I think, um, so, and, and we, uh, we in, the, in political life tend to play to the, to the media narrative, um, and of course the media are responsive to what we say. So, so I think the focus on this, um, on this element of the bigger issue, this element of the solution, um, is, is of course the responsibility. I'm responsible for what I say, but I can point to all the other things I've said as well. And I know that when I've been privileged to come on the show, uh, we haven't talked as much about those other aspects. So, so I think that that is unfortunately going to play itself. Well, unfortunately, it is going to play itself out. There's going to be a discussion. People are going to vote. It's going to be one of the issues on, on, the, on the ballot. But what's important is that on the other side of that issue, there is today alignment among provincial and I believe federal leaders around the important and critical nature of this issue. And we can embrace that uh, alignment on the other side of, of, uh, of an election. I guess I just finally on this, uh, Mandy gave me a look, but um, do you worry about the zero sum game effect on that this as well? I mean, look. do we have time now for that zero sum game where there's winners and losers if we're all in this, and this is just this one issue, but if there's these other issues as well, do we have time for, for that? Well, I mean, uh, we, we, 
we don't have time not to be acting, which is why we are. So one of the things to set up this conversation, we are doing the first ever assessment, frankly, in the country, but in Ontario for sure, of the impacts of climate change, because that's what they did in the UK that actually drove the debate and drove it from a, a catastrophic discussion, not that it couldn't be, but down to a grassroots discussion of how it affects people. That's part of how they changed the narrative from a political debate. So, so much work is being done to be, be in a position to have that conversation. Um, the, uh, but it, but this, it's also an important debate um, around how. And so I'm not minimizing the discussion about carbon tax or not. Those are important issues. Um, but I think, I think the, the, um, you know, the, the, the important conversation is actually going to happen after. And I think there's alignment for that conversation. And I'd encourage, as people think about this issue, particularly around adaptation, uh, and, the, and how we're going to adjust to this, but also around mitigation for certain, the issue of how we reduce greenhouse gases, for people to recognize that this time next year, we, can, we will be in a position where that issue we're all absorbed with, or at least I'm absorbed with and Matt's mm. absorbed with, is, um, is, is resolved, and we're now on to solutions. So. I believe the penguin wanted to say something. You had a look. Well, you know, down home we have a saying. Uh-oh. Are you ready? Yes. The saying is, is that some people have enough mouth for three sets of teeth. I'm not looking at you, Rod. <laughs> Tradeism is a thing. And if anybody knows me, I left home with a dirty hockey bag, a little bit of personality and some ambition. And I've flipped this industry upside down. I'm not only female, I'm gay on top of it. And did I tell you I'm in construction? How do you like them lobsters? <laughs> the reality is, is that I am on the federal government's doorstep. I am on the provincial doorstep. And I'm letting people know that the perception behind the skilled trade industry has hurt us so badly. And now, Mother Nature has crawled up our ass, basically, and said, you need to fix this. And here's the thing, Abigail, my love, I would love to build every person in this city a place to live. And I will, but I can't because I don't have anybody. So I'm going to say to you, Rod, as a politician and as a man that's put himself in the, in the limelight, we need to work together. The white and the blue callers need to form a bond and it needs to happen now, I am a pilot project that went really, really right. Why do you think that in, in 2019 there's still that stigma that, that follows the <laughs> trades? I mean, people have been trying to figure this out, and there were a number of steps that were taken to try and, and, and I mean, whether you focus on, you know, quality of life and the work that you're doing, the money you can make, why, what, what, what's still going on there? It's our parents. Our parents have loved our kids so much that we've absolutely hurt our economy. The same people that came here and built all of the infrastructure that we all enjoy every day are the same parents that were treated like second class citizens in our country called Canada. And those same parents looked at their children and said, you need to go to university. Because if you don't go to university, you will not be respected like I wasn't respected. And what people don't understand about the blue collar industry and the skilled trades as a whole, it's not just about getting your hands dirty. That's the fun part. It's tech, it's automation, it's robotics. It's, I mean, have you ever seen all that in a bag of chips sitting in front of you with a microphone right now? No. The point is, is that right now, we are not educated on what the skilled trade industry really is. People go to the place of, that's for the kids that aren't smart. They go to skilled trade school. That's who's going. And here's the thing. I'm so goddamn excited about millennials. Oh my God, I love them. I love them. But here's the thing. They all show up in my office with three or four years of debt. They're depressed. They're repressed. 
And they're looking at me and going, Mandy, I should have never listened to my parents. I should have taken the road I wanted to take. And so this is what I'm going to say to everybody today. One more thing. Oh, yeah, friend. keep going. <laughs> we got time. If you're going to Twitter something today, Twitter this. Get your phones ready. Get your phones ready. Pride equals performance. Pride equals performance. If we can fill our trade schools, all of the issues on this panel today will disappear. Because one woman in the army, in, a, in the trade industry, is an army. It fixes so many things that lodge us right now with being diverse and inclusive. And I can tell you this, the people that are even in the industry that shouldn't be in the industry, my sweetie, I can't even get rid of them because I have nobody to replace them with. So I want to be clear, when you call to get your dishwasher repaired, you should call the guy at AI that just did a panel and see if he can help you because he can't. The next time you call and you want three quotes on your house, let me know how many people call you back. This is real. Pride equals performance. We'll come back to that. Um, you talked and very briefly, you said, I said, what's at stake? And you said, it's, it's about our children. It's about the future of, the, of those kids. Um, there are a lot of people, I think, in this room who are still taken aback by the scale of the issue that you deal with every single day. Um, Savan had the, that comment that, you know, it's in your neighborhood, it's postal code agnostic, that it's in your building. Um, what keeps you up at night about, about the scale of the problem that you're dealing with? What keeps me up at night? Yeah. Well, um, for me, it's a lot of people are unaware of what human trafficking is. And for example, show of hands, how many people here know what, ha what human trafficking is? Okay, that's good. Because a lot of people, they don't understand what it is. So awareness is the key. Um, a lot of people don't realize that it's happening right here in our own backyard. In fact, it, like it was said earlier, it's a billion dollar criminal industry. And a lot of these traffickers, they know that the risk of getting caught is very low, but the reward is very high. And it's one of the fastest growing crimes that's occurring right here in the GTA. So a lot of people don't understand exactly what it is. They confuse human trafficking with human smuggling. They think it's where people from another country, they're fleeing their country to go somewhere else. That is an agreement. With human trafficking, you can't consent to it. And the big thing is, what people don't quite understand, they think that, hey, you know what, I don't see it, so it's not really happening. Um, and what we do, we, we, bring it to the, we bring it to everyone's attention. We try to put it out in the media. We let people know that this is actually happening. And it's happening to our kids. It's happening to the girl next door. And it's happening to these young girls. Can I stop you right yep. there? So that's the, to me, there's a bunch of things that people have kind of picked up on across the, the conversation, but it's that us and them piece, right? Yes. Um, how, how big of a, a hurdle is that in tackling the problem? First, you have to know about it, but also in truly tackling it if we think it's, well, that's not anybody that I would know. That's them. And it turns out that them is actually us. How big of a deal is that? It's definitely a big deal. Um, definitely. Uh, it's happening all over. And some people think that they're not going to be affected, but human trafficking, um, there's no preference. It doesn't matter race. It doesn't matter religion, economic status. It doesn't matter. It affects everyone. Um, a lot of our victims that we deal with, they're coming from all different types of uh, households, broken homes, uh, good family. It doesn't matter. And that's what a lot of people need to realize, that it could happen to your own child. So when you think about strategies to try and, and tackle this in a meaningful way, beyond telling people that it's happening, where do you start? And what, is, what is step one? Step one is awareness. Definitely awareness. Education is empowerment. We need to educate not only everyone here, but when you go home today, like talk to your family, talk to your kids, talk to your neighbors, especially at work. If you work in the social, sorry, the 
customer service industry, talk to your employees. You need to be able to identify what it is and talk to them. In order to know what it is, that's the way that we could prevent it and report it. And we need to educate these young people because they need to understand what it is in order to protect themselves and to make better decisions as well. What have you heard on the panel that would give you kind of a way into dealing with this in a different way? This was all about kind of taking what we think we know and kind of shaking it up a little bit. Um, you know, not just shaking the envelope, but tearing it up. What is it that you've heard that you think might, might nudge this conversation around what you're doing in a different direction? Uh, hmm. Besides take a trade. Um, definitely, I would have to say, take some action. Uh, get out there, talk about it, um, create awareness. And there's so many different organizations that help these victims of trauma. You need to get involved, volunteer, talk about it, um, create uh, training, have events like this, have a training day in your workplace, talk to your kids in church, have seminars, let people know that this is actually taking place here in Toronto and all over the GTA. Not, it's not only occurring overseas, but here. And we need to talk about it and you know what? We all have a responsibility. It's not just the police. Each and every one of us have the responsibility to stop human trafficking. If you take a look, um, Wendell, at, at getting beyond the division um, and that zero-sum game, what are the steps that you start to take to try and bring people into a conversation rather than shut them out? Because it's not new. People know that this is, in, in this region, people know that this is overdue, long overdue, um, embarrassingly overdue. So what do you say to people about, about you know, putting the, uh, the cinder block on the accelerator and actually moving forward? How do you get out of that mindset? So the really important piece is that agency is critical. Agency and self-assertion are absolutely critical. When we look back to um, after World War II, um, and how Canadian society evolved, and how the United States also evolved after World War II. Minority communities, especially uh, black communities, Jewish communities, um, Asian communities, indigenous communities, people were assertive. They asserted themselves, they demanded change. And so it is fundamentally important that the manner in which we teach our young people, the manner in which we teach other aspiring civic leaders from various diverse communities is one where one has to assert themselves, right? It's absolutely vital because the type of change that we all want to see cannot be top down. If it is top down, it'll absolutely fail and we'll all have egg on our face. So it has to be from both sides of the spectrum, from both top and bottom, where those who want to see themselves reflected in positions of leadership are asserting themselves in a manner that also disarms those who do have power. Because it's, it's that very delicate dance. You were nodding, Rob. Yeah, I mean this, and this is the inevitable plug that a former chair of civic action will make for civic action, but the, um, the emerging leaders network, the fact that there are a thousand or two thousand now, not a thousand, uh, this is, you know, the, uh, the diversity fellows, which is such a fabulous program, but, but now as someone who is, is for the first time in, a, in an elected position and one of the people that people try to prod, um, what, uh, what Wendell just said absolutely matters, right? The, pre the pressure up and, and the willingness to understand that there are different points of view. One of the things that I think has been so effective about, about what Civic Action does and other groups does is, is it's not just the ability to state your point of view. I mean, that's important, but it's then the ability to engage, right? Because chances are you aren't 100% right. It's a shocking thing to learn in life, but you do eventually. And so, so it is great to be able to convey your position in a strong way. It is also important to know that people may disagree and disagree strongly and from a different point of view. But, but all of these issues require that discussion. And then, and then of course, it's the, the, the willingness, the, the, not the experience of just going back to our corners and saying, boy, I delivered, delivered those talking points well. Boy, that, that tweet really showed them something. Um, but that the, then you, you move onto solutions. Matt, can I just, on yeah, the other, just yeah. a common theme, like as I listen mm -hmm. about these, is that so much of this, I mean, we, we exist in a market economy. You can say for better or worse, I will say for better. But, but, but it is the, the reality we, we work in. And when we look at a lot of these issues, whether it's the power imbalance, whether it's housing and how we deal with housing, whether it's something like sex trafficking, so we're dealing with issues, it's a market, right? And certainly when we're dealing with skilled trades. And I think as 
you think about these issues today, understand that there are a number of solutions, but most of the housing that's going to get built is going to get built from a market perspective. You know, that doesn't mean it's the only way to build housing. The power dynamics we talk about in boardrooms and otherwise are, as you said, Matt, about, about I, you know, people don't want to give up what they got. But, it's a, but, but the, that is a fundamentally a behavior thing. And the behavior that most of us have is to do what we think is right. Now, the really good point is we don't always know. Our parents don't always point us in the right direction. But to the extent that people can, we can align what people believe is right for themselves with what's right collectively, that's, that's exponential progress. To the extent we try to dictate it, um, it's a much harder, much harder road to hope. That would suggest that, that the place, he says to the man from government, um, that the place for government in this is not maybe as strong as people might expect or want. That they would turn to government and say, lead us out of this problem, whether it's through uh, the housing issue, whether it's through enforcement of um, policies that would create greater diversity, whether it's changing how we think about skills, uh, whether it's making sure that hotels uh, and people who work in you know, uh, Airbnb know about this. Does that take some of the, not to take the heat off government, no, no. but does that take some of the pressure? Government has the enormous responsibility of having been elected and put in place to make sure that these issues um, have the right uh, focus and ability, and this is where I think the, this kind of debate changes that focus positively. But back to civic action, the, the principles behind which David Pico uh, formed it around were that there were actually the requirements from the broader civil society. There was government, there was business, there was the, the not-for-profit sector, and that the creating and labor and labor unions, and creating a, a sandbox, as Savon would say, where those four groups could play on fixing issues that weren't putting them at risk, is is necessary. So it's not to take away from government's responsibility. We, we, we get elected to solve problems and we should and we should be held accountable where we don't. Um, but, um, but the definition of those problems is very much a collective activity and, and the resolution at a practical level can't, um, can't be all government. Whether we philosoph Some people think philosophically it should be. Whether you think that or not, I don't happen to think that, it can't be because it is not something that government can solve on its own. Mandy. I'm, I mean, I would... Oh, sorry. go ahead. Yeah. I would say I... When we think about affordable housing, that's where I would pause to say that perhaps it is government. Uh, we do need government to be strongly involved. I do think that it's Involved possible. in what, in particular? Um, well, for, particularly from a um, policy and financial perspective. So if we're talking about incomes and what people are making, one of the challenges that we have is right now in the region is that people's incomes aren't sufficient enough to rent or buy housing. So they're leaving. Um, they are paying perhaps more than 30% of their incomes on rent. That's about 50% of the people who are renting in Toronto. So that's significant. These are in individuals who are working full-time jobs. So let's say that Mandy got them a job in the trades. Will that trade worker be able to live in the region when house prices have increased between 130% to 181%? Can they buy? Probably not. Can they rent? Maybe, barely. Will that be a quality of life that we saw 25 years ago? Probably not. I think in my generation we say, Pension, probably not. That's not going to exist. I remember getting my first job, and it was, it was working in a summer employment program. I'm from the East Coast as well. And yeah. it was in Halifax. And one of the individuals at HR um, DC at the time, Human Resources Development Canada, was she was really lovely, lovely, lovely woman. And she strongly encouraged us to start putting saving for RSPs and you know, start saving towards your pension. And we were just looking at her pension like it's not going to be around. Like, is the government going to give us pension X number of years from now when we, when we actually retire. And that's, that's, those are some of the realities you're facing now. Pensioners are not able to stay in the units that they're renting. So I do think that there is a role for government in housing. And from, from a policy perspective, let's look at where can we build. Two thirds of the land in the city of Toronto is single detached housing. And we have explicit rules that say, you can't build anything but single detached housing, not in my backyard. That's significant. Two thirds, of, two, two thirds of the land, sorry, that are that's residential. So, so that's significant, and that's from a policy planning perspective. From a financial perspective, if we're talking about affordability, non-market housing requires government intervention. Non-market ho housing requires government intervention. It cannot be built without support from government. When we built lots of non-profit housing, non-market housing, social housing, co-ops, that was like. <laughs> That was 30 to 40 years ago, and we stopped. We barely, barely some trickles of that. 
So when we say we have a housing crisis, and we say that, is there a role for government? Yes, there is. Rod, did you want to answer any of that? No, I, I mean, do that, you agree with all of that? Uh, um, what, a, what I, I agree. Uh, did you want me to protect you? <laughs> That's okay. Well, Listen, the, 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 again, great example, the definition of the problem, right? The problem of affordability. There's no question government has a role, both from a policy and from a financial perspective. But to solve the problem, right? If, if, I mean, the issue of affordability was the principal issue in the last provincial election. All parties agreed on it. We happened to get the most seats and we had a perspective which was about trying to put more money in people's pockets and, and as opposed to another way of handling it, which was to, to try to make things more affordable in a different way. But, but this issue of affordability is systemic, right? It is, and, and government doesn't have the capacity just to make everybody have more money. Right, it 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 it, we, it just doesn't work that way because it has to come from somewhere. So the like I would bet if we give Mandy a chance, she would tell you if you can get a job in the skilled trades, you probably will be able to afford to you know buy a house. When I see what what people are making in those trades, so that's a role. So how this is where they connect. How does government get out of the way in a positive way of making sure that people can get the skills they need so that those people can get jobs? But that's part an important part of the solution. So I just say I think the problems defined well. The balance of the solution is where it gets tricky, but I get back to it, most of the housing and the housing that's going to be built is going to be built in market conditions. Not all of it, most of it. And if we don't acknowledge that, then we're, we're not focusing on the biggest possible solution. And I think what I would say is that most has been of the housing that has been built, it has been in, um, yeah, by the private sector market conditions, but it's also largely been condos and homes to buy, so homes to purchase. And again, we need to think about incomes. If Michelle was able, she was able to get some of these women and, and youth and individuals who are impacted and involved in human traf trafficking out of that, they're not gonna just go into renting an apartment. Um, there's, there's security issues, there's a lot of other things to deal with. They'll be going into some level of transitional housing, and that's explicitly non-market housing. And to build that is, is not any less costly than building a condominium. It may not be less a luxury condominium, but it's not any less costly. So to build that, when we're saying that individuals are paying less, we need to somehow come up with the financial tools to actually, um, and the, the money to, to build it and to be able to operate it when individuals are not paying the full percentage for their rent. And so I would suggest, and this is self-promotion, nonprofit developer, <laughs> um, that we need more of the nonprofit development to happen because part of what that does is that it takes out the profit element. It can work alongside organizations. It's not solving the problem for everybody, but it helps to solve some of the issues for lower and moderate income households. And how does it do that? It's, it's working with the financial tools that we now have from the co-investment fund at CMHC. The feds are back in housing. That is amazing. After 30 years, it's like, I didn't think, think I'd seen in my lifetime. They're back. It's a start. It's a, it's a big-ish start, but it's still a start. It's not like, it's not exactly where we want to be, but it's still a start. We have the, the city of Toronto and some of the other cities, they're doing things with um, doing, providing incentives through the planning process. And those incentives work for both private sector as well as nonprofit sector. Adding up all those caps of stack of, uh, sorry, um, stacks of capital allow, is, is allows affordable housing to be developed and to be financed and to get low cost construction loans and grants and reduction and waivers, all those things add together because ultimately you're not bringing a lot of equity to the table. Ultimately, you're not bringing a lot of cash to the table. And these, so that, that's where I would say that the role of government is, is really significant. Mandy, I know you wanted to say something just about that role of government. You're egging me on, you know that. I, you nodded to me, that's all. I'm not trying to. Okay. So what I would like to say to everybody up on the stage and everybody out in the audience is the one thing that I bring to the table other than being the blue collar CEO is an incredible business acumen. And I think the thing that as Canadians we're not realizing is a very socialized country as a whole and becoming more socialized is the fact that we put a lot, a lot of pressure on governments to fix everything. And the one thing I realized, and I'll tell you a very thin version of a fat story, I was invited to be the keynote speaker for the Liberal government in Sherbrooke in January. They didn't know what hit that poor little town. <laughs> wow. And so what was interesting is, is I spoke to every level of government, 
And of course, it was like, you know, who's the, you know, smiley girl that came in and, you know, and everybody. And then all of a sudden, I told them my story and I explained to them what I was doing. And literally, they went from being cabinet ministers to civil workers to becoming human beings. And they kind of sat down and they saw it doesn't get more real than this bear. And I was there to educate them on the fact that each one of them are human beings. They've come and taken on a position to change policy, enforce policy, and to be quite frank, just be the point person. And what I realized sitting there at that day is they needed me just as much as I need them right now. And from a trilateral way of thinking, we do that really shitty in Canada. Really shitty. And we need to know that right now you can't depend on government. We don't have enough people paying taxes. We have as many people in Canada that fits inside of California. You have to know that we need to attract more foreign investment. We need to start running this company and what's on this panel right now as a business that's governed by Canadian ethics. And if we don't do that right now, because all we're going to do is talk in circles. Kind of like what you're going to see a little bit today and everywhere else. We need to act now. People that have my way of thinking, that know how to build people, know how to build companies, know how to make money, need to collectively partner with the Rods and Harvard and my friend and Abigail. We need to do it together and stop talking about it and just do it. Why do, you, why do you think that's not happening then? If, if, if people generally have the same goals, everybody agrees on, on, on what we're trying to do here. You have different approaches oh, to yes, it. Oh yes, everybody people, agrees. Yeah. Oh yes. Is it just we're just too polite and oh, pat sweet. ourselves on the back? And... Listen, they invited me to a NAFTA talk. <laughs> And I looked over at the girl next to me and I said, why am I here? And she laughed and she said, Mandy, you're the reality check in the room. And the reality here is right now is that Canadians are too polite. We're not the greatest marketers. We take our commodities and we give them away to somebody that's more than willing to do it better. And I'm saying that right now, everybody agrees, but nobody's collectively coming together and putting a pounding on it. And I've made it my life's work. I could be out there making more money. I could. But I spend every minute of every day changing the perception behind the skilled trade industry because I know as soon as I seen the slideshow come up from my friend, I knew that every part of those slides were tied to the systemic issue we have in the skilled trade industry. Mm. Do you feel like you're making much headway? And that's a question I could ask all of you, but we'll start with you. Do you feel like you're making much headway in this? I do. Yeah. I feel like I'm making headway for the simple fact that every time I talk, everybody's staring at me doing this. <laughs> what about you, Michelle? I mean, this is a massive problem and a problem that scares the hell out of people, in part because they don't know about it when they learn about it and they learn that it could be their kid who's being lured in through uh, conversations they're having on social media, their eyes get wide. Um, but then they learn the scale of it. Do you feel that the work that you're doing thus far is, is moving that needle? I definitely think so. Um, I work with the team, which is one of the biggest teams, human trafficking team in Canada. And it's because we realize that it's such a big problem that we need a lot of officers assigned to tackle this problem. And every day, like we're, we're working nonstop. Um, we have an on-call team and even though we have so many officers, it's the work is just nonstop. And I definitely have to say that our team, we're out doing surveillance, we're doing John plays where we go to hotels and we set up dates. We'll go online. If there's missing girls, we're out there looking for these, these girls. And we're not only arresting these guys, which most of the pimps or traffickers happen to be male, we're arresting. So we definitely are making in, an impact. What happens when you, when when it works, when one of those girls who would be caught up in that gets out, what happens? What's very important is that we have the opportunity to rescue these girls. It's great that we have a conviction, we charge these guys, but rescuing these girls and getting them out of that lifestyle, that's where we, definitely where we are rewarded. 
And in that, I mean, give me an example. In that moment of reward, what is that, what is that like for, for them? Uh, for example, I, I had a case where a young lady, she was, she was trafficked for over six years. Uh, she was physically assaulted, um, you name it. And she thought that this was her boyfriend. And she would have done anything for this guy, but he totally manipulated her. Eventually, he, he assaulted her, police were notified, and we were able to rescue her. Um, now at this point, we, he, sorry, he was convicted. He received one of the, the second highest sentence in Canada, which was 14 years. And this young lady now, she's out, uh, speaking, counseling to other victims of human trafficking. So when we see situations like that, um, we know that we're doing a good job. She has her life back. Yes. Yeah. Um, in the work that you're doing, Rod, but also just in these broader conversations, because I know you're plugged in, I mean, with all the issues that are on the stage, where do you see progress? Where do you see signs that, that um, the arrow is being shot in the right direction? I do think there's more conversations like this than, than people um, appreciate. And by that, I mean conversations where people are able to agree, agree to disagree, but also focus on resolution. I, uh, just a very personal experience. Uh, when, when I took on the role, one of the first things we had done in the campaign was made clear we disagreed with the cap and trade system, which was more or less universally agreed to by, by most of the larger environmental groups as, as the right way to go. So we started off on maybe not the best foot with that, those groups. But I can tell you, um, Matt, and I've mentioned it to you before, I've been really pleased that in that context, almost all of those groups on the many other things we're dealing with, whether it's clean water or clean air or, or our work um, around things like revising the recycling program, dealing with waste, they've still come forward, and not just come forward privately, which I appreciate, um, but come forward in public settings for those conversations, because people want to be engaged. And I think uh, we, we can learn something from that because that, that gives you the ability to disagree. Think we are doing things differently than we would have done if we hadn't been engaged on those files. I think we're doing them better than we would have done. We may disagree on something, but we don't disagree on everything. And it gets back to, I think, what Abigail did well. Just If you define the problem uh, effectively, and if you've got agreement on the problem, as I said, I think in the issue of climate change, we have agreement on the problem, mm. disagreement on severity perhaps, but, but agreement on the problem and really only disagreement about science uh, on the severity, not about what we need to do, right. then, then I think you can move fairly directly into, into things that are moving in the right direction. So that really makes, that's heartening even in the world of a fairly dynamic public policy uh, and political fight. Um, and I think that works on every one of these, uh, these files and others. Abigail, for you, you're going to have a room full of people who are going to leave and go and try and crack some of these big issues. Um, where do you see the optimism? Well, I think it's looking at new models of how do we do um, housing. And so, yes, I said there's a lot of responsibility on the government. Yes, there's a role for private sector, and there's also a role for, for the nonprofit sector as well. And the company that I work for um, emerged out of seeing the need for nonprofits wanting to be engaged in affordable housing, but not having the money to do a lot of the upfront work around the design and getting through planning approvals. So trying to raise money to help and assist them in doing that. And then also having in individuals who are interested in seeing a social return on their, invested, in their investment. So foundations, um, organizations, individuals who came together and said that we were gonna pool money together so you have a $4 million pool of funds to work with these organizations through those early stages and to help them. And, so, and then also to provide some, some level of, of equity investment. So these are, this is a, a new way of leveraging market tools, working with individuals that are socially aligned that, that do have that business sense but also wanna see that social return on investment. And then also working and, and, and leveraging government tools as well as um, the community and to fulfill community driven and community um, uh, driven ideas and, and, and to work towards creating affordable housing and community owned assets. So I do see that this shows an emergence mm. of new types of models and we're doing that here. We're doing that in Vancouver. There are other, are other organizations um, in Canada that are doing that. It's, there's a lot more happening in the States, but we're at least in Canada, we've actually um, emerged into this market and we're creating a space to see some development of non-market housing. Wendell, we started with you, we'll end with you. Um, optimism that uh, people in this room can leave with to go and figure out how to uh, crack the issue of creating an inclusive city. I work with youth, I'm an educator, I've worked with uh, young men and women in some of the most challenging 
neighborhoods um, in Toronto, as well as the region itself. And young people provide me with a lot of optimism. Um, but on that note, as I've stated earlier, it is vitally important that the way we speak with them regarding inclusion, regarding um, creating opportunities for those who have been marginalized is not, again, one of someone has to gain and someone has to lose. Um, so similarly, I've been hearing uh, much about, not today, but in previous conversations, to the point where I had to tell my colleagues, my very progressive colleagues and interlocutors that when we speak about the challenges in our society, it's perfectly fine to point out where there are maybe structural barriers, but we need to stop short of somehow scapegoating one particular group and saying, well, the problems that exist are because of straight white men in our society. That is very problematic. Every time we do that, somebody who could be a progressive, who could one day become a progressive um, leader of RBC or another entity will sit back and say, I'm a straight white man, so now I can't play that important role, and somehow I'm the source of the problems in our society. We need to stay away from that type of rhetoric. Encourage our young women, encourage our young men, encourage all our youth in our society to think that everyone has a role to play and that this is not a zero-sum game. You're charged with uh, this. The good words of a smart panel of people. Um, put your hands together, if you would, again, for uh, Wendell Adjate. Abigail Mariah, Rod Phillips, Michelle Powell, and Mandy Renahan. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Rob McIsaac, and I have the great honor of uh, being a board member at Civic Action and uh, also to uh, thank our uh, panelists and moderator today. Uh, I think we're off to a great start, uh, and that's not just because we have all learned a few new East Coast uh, expressions, which no doubt will be put to good use going forward. Thanks to uh, Matt, Mandy, Michelle, Abigail, Dr. Ajate. Uh, and Minister Phillips for getting us off to uh, such a great start. I think uh, the panel was incredibly informative. It strikes me that what defined and drove success for us as a city region looking backwards uh, will not get us to where we need to be going forward. Uh, the issues we're facing have such a degree of complexity that not, no one of us will be able to solve these issues. It will require crowds as smart and as big as this one to help us move ahead. And that's why <clears throat> we are charging all of you to help us redefine what success looks like going forward and also to help us identify the key levers that we'll need uh, to be pulling to help us get there. I hope the panel this morning helped to uh, inspire some fresh thinking in all of you. Um, thanks again to our moderator, Matt Galloway, for doing such a wonderful job. <clears throat> um, please also extend your thanks to uh, our wonderful panelists for getting us going. So uh, Sevon handed me this very lengthy list of housekeeping items, which I'm now going to go through. She said, uh, I hope you're a good reader and please make it inspirational. <laughs> um, <laughs> so let me get through this. The first session uh, that each of you would have registered uh, for will begin in 15 minutes. So you've got a little bit of time to catch up on some emails and phone calls and so on. Uh, you'll find the morning and afternoon activity sessions you registered for on the back of your name badge. So if you've forgotten what you were interested in, you'll just have to look at the back of your badge to, re to remember. You can also find this information and much more in the, as Sev said, the Fancy Pants Canvas event app. If you haven't had a chance uh, to download it, there are instructions, uh, again, uh, neatly located on the back of your name badge. We have a full house today, so please attend the sessions you registered for. They'll, there will be a large, burly people outside uh, preventing anybody who tries to switch. Um, 
Those of you attending the session on Resilient City, please proceed downstairs to Walker Court on the ground level via the elevators on, the other si on either side. If you're attending the gallery tour on inclusive cities, please make your way to the second floor via the elevators. For the reframing where and how we live, film screening and panel discussion about affordable housing, please make your way to Jackman Hall, which is on the concourse level uh, below the ground floor via the elevators uh, to, my, to my left. Uh, volunteers are available to show you the way, and you'll find maps, again, in that app if you choose to download it. Uh, we are going to see you back here uh, this afternoon for the afternoon plenary session that will begin at 3.20 p.m., uh, and we are very committed to staying on schedule. If you need to visit the facilities, wash washrooms are located uh, through the doors to my right. For those of you uh, joining us via live stream, your online facilitated session will begin at 11.05 a.m. Thank you in advance uh, for all of your contributions today and all of your good ideas on how we can move forward. We know uh, that sometimes these can be uh, difficult discussions, but we also know that uh, this is a safe place for us to have them. So let's get moving. Thanks so much, everybody.